Acura, the first premium automotive brand from Japan in the United States. It opened the path for other Asian automakers to sell luxury cars in America, and since 1986 and throughout the 90s, they were widely considered to be the go-to car brand if you wanted performance, innovation, excitement, and above all, reliability in a premium car. And from there, it's been pretty wild. Their sales became stagnant, and they've had some good and some bad years. In this video, I want to try to explain how Acura won the hearts of many Americans back in the late 80s while focusing on a few iconic models, company decisions, and changes in consumer taste that helped shape the brand to what it is today. In 2022, Acura sold slightly over 102,000 vehicles in the United States, its primary market. With such weak sales, one can only wonder what happened. Honda blamed weak yearly sales to supply issues rather than demand, but is it really true? Is Acura where it used to be? The United States represents the biggest market for luxury vehicles. In 2022, it represented $7.2 billion in sales, which was twice as much as the second biggest market, Germany. So, with the United States being such an important market for the segment, one can only wonder why Acura and its parent company Honda haven't done more to remain relevant in America since Acura was created precisely for the American market. I have to respect the premium division of Honda, a small car company well known for building reliable automobiles that produces less than half as many vehicles as Toyota with about 4 million vehicles sold worldwide in 2022. So, as you can see, volume-wise, Acura represents a very small portion of Honda. So, does Acura really matter to the company anymore? While Honda is this small, smart, cost-effective brand that seems to be constantly punching above its weight, Acura has struggled to continue to be a reference of luxury and performance in North America. In 1986, Honda Motor Company introduced the Acura brand in the United States. It was the first Japanese brand to offer premium vehicles in the US. It was an ambitious plan to introduce premium vehicles to compete with BMW and Mercedes-Benz. It started small, offering only two models, the Legend and the Integra. Finally, Honda had in Acura a premium car for those Honda loyal customers that had done well in life and were ready to move up market. By the mid 80s, Honda had been in the United States long enough to have proven itself as a reputable car company that produced small passenger vehicles that were well built and were fuel efficient compared to larger offerings from American brands. The fuel crisis of the 1970s opened the door to brands like Honda, Nissan, and Toyota to establish themselves in the American car market. But until then, Honda lovers had nowhere to go upmarket past the Honda Accord, and Inacura found a vehicle within the Honda umbrella that was larger and more opulent that cost way less than German alternatives. These two vehicles were front-wheel drive. Therefore, Acura's complete lineup was composed of front-wheel drive vehicles, unlike the rest of the segment. An engine seated sideways has many advantages, and I like the way Car and Director puts it. It frees up interior seating and cargo room and, in the case of transverse engines, provides more crutch space between the front of the car and its occupants. And without a long drive shaft, rear axle or rear differential, the car carries less mass. This coupled with reduced driveline loss aids efficiency. Also, front wheel drive construction puts the heaviest components of the car over the tires driving it, increasing traction on the slippery surfaces. A front wheel drive platform in a fuel efficient small car that still maximizes interior space is among other things what allow Honda to elbow its way into the American tasting cars. In the case of the Acura Legend, it had a V6 that could do 0 to 60 in under 8 seconds, similar to the Mercedes E Class. The Legend was a mid sized four door sedan that competed against the BMW 5 Series and the Mercedes Benz E Class. It was a foot bigger than the Accord. Fully optioned, a 1987 Acura Legend ran for about $23,000, while a BMW 535 will retail for about $33,000, and the base model Mercedes Benz E Class will list for $39,000. In 1987, the Acura Legend featured things like cruise control, speed sensitive power steering, power windows and locks, air conditioning, four speaker stereo with a seven band graphic equalizer, and listen to this a dual diversity antenna. What is that? I don't know. The front console was designed to accommodate a cellular telephone, which indicated that despite its relative affordability, this car was aimed at affluent people who had mobile phones at the time because not just anybody could have a cell phone back then. A power sunroof was standard and leather seating surfaces was an option for higher trim packages. It was well received by the press for its sharp handling thanks to its four-wheel independent suspension, the ample interior room, and fuel efficiency. 
It could be opted with a manual transmission, which gave it an appeal of sportiness along with Honda's first ever V6 engine in any of the production cars. The interior was a smaller hatchback that attempted to steal some cells from the 3 Series. The top of the line Interior LS was listed for under $13,000, while a BMW 3 Series will sell for almost twice as much. The Interior was also very well received by the press. Car and Driver magazine included the Integra in the 10 best cars list. It was offered in two variants, a 3 and a 5 door hatchback. The Integra featured a Revy 1.6 liter double overhead cam, 4 cylinder engine, and a 5 speed manual transmission. Both cars were an immediate success, so much that in 1990, Acura moved 138,000 vehicles outselling Mercedes, BMW, and Lexus. Into the 90s, Acura kept the brand hot with the introduction of his first sports car, the Acura NSX, a real-wheel drive mid-engine sports car that aimed to compete with more expensive supercars of the era at a fraction of the cost. It was the first all-aluminum production car that had great looks, a supercar stance and performance, all while having the reputation of Honda reliability. By the late 1990s, everything was going great for Acura. The brand had introduced another model in the cool name of the Viker, but in a very interesting plot twist, Acura decided to switch to alphanumeric names, ditching some of the coolest car names to date, at least in my opinion, especially the Acura legend. This move was intended to be in sync with German luxury brands. Honda executives thought that Acura went a longer way than any other individual nameplate, but in that, they gave up a very cool name, The Legend. Another mistake that cost Acura market share, I believe, was their inability to react to changes in consumer taste. In the mid-1990s, SUVs had a surge in popularity, and Acura's answer to this was, in 1996, to rebatch an Isuzu Trooper to get its foot in the door while they work in the upcoming MDX. The Isuzu Trooper, unfortunately, had been targeted by consumer reports for having a high rollover risk, which could have hurt the sales of the SLX, an otherwise truck-based capable SUV. Acura was never a stranger to rebadging vehicles. Since its inception, most of their models are rebadged vehicles sold as Hondas in markets outside the United States, which may not sit well with someone coming from outside the brand that is ready to move up market to a true luxury brand. It's not only the fact that many Acuras share platforms with Honda cars, which may not necessarily be a bad thing, but they also share many of their components. So sometimes sitting in an Acura may not be or feel or look too much different than sitting in a Honda. If I had a dollar for every time people thought that my TSX is a Honda Accord, maybe because it is the European Honda Accord, other things that hurt the brand in the 90s and into the early 2000s was their inability or unwillingness to produce the premium vehicles consumer wanted. And like other premium brands, Acura never offered a V8 in any of their vehicles and did not offer a real-wheel drive platform on any of their cars outside the unaffordable for most NSX. Unlike Lexus, which by contrast went all out with the introduction of the LS, a proper real-wheel drive, full-size sedan with a V8 under the hood, back in 1989, making a strong statement that it was here to compete with Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Speaking of which, the original NSX was Acura's Halo car from 1991 to 2005, and although the sales figures were small, it was an important car for Acura as it helped build the brand in the US. Unfortunately, it failed in sales and left the US in 2005, and yes, it was also a rebadge Honda. In 1990, the NSX sold for around $60,000, the equivalent of $112,000 in 2017, the year that the NSX was reintroduced to the US market, but this time it sold in its base form for $156,000, which made it even less affordable for most. The second generation NSX was a modern approach to a relative budget supercar that implemented hybrid technology, the use of carbon fiber and aluminum, and it had a hybrid electric powertrain. It combined a twin turbocharged 3.5 V6 with three electric motors for a total of 573 horsepower and 476 pound-feet of torque, and it was mated to a dual clutch automatic transmission. It could do 0 to 60 in 3.1 seconds, and it was discontinued in 2022 due to slow sales as well. Remember that earlier in this video, I told you that in 1990, Acura outsold Mercedes by almost double the sales in the United States? Well, in comparison, in 2022, Mercedes sold three times as many vehicles as Acura. And BMW, the ultimate driving machine, sold over three times what Acura did in 2022. Why is this? 
I already mentioned some of the reasons why I think that Acura lost some of its appeal with the American car buyer. Furthermore, unlike German competition, Acura did not expand its lineup. In the late 1980s, brands like BMW were offering five vehicles in the United States, the three, the five, and the seven series. It also sold the lower volume six and eight series, while Acura was only offering two vehicles. Fast forward to 2023, in the United States, BMW's portfolio consists of over 20 different models, while Acura features only five different vehicles. The Integra, the TLX, the MDX, the RDX, and the ZDX. Currently, Lexus offers 12 different models, and Mercedes sells over 20 models in the United States as well. While most premium brands have expanded the portfolio to adapt to the ever-changing and evolving American consumer taste in vehicles, Acura has stuck to its original recipe of offering a very small selection of vehicles. One undeniable co-feature of some Acura models is the availability of their all-wheel drive system called Super Handling All-Wheel Drive. In a nutshell, it is a system that can send up to 70% of engine torque to the rear axle and of that, 100% can be directed to the rear outside wheel. This reduces understeer, usually associated with front-wheel drive vehicles. But in my personal opinion, as good as this system is, there's no substitute for proper real wheel base acceleration and unfortunately, Acura doesn't offer this cool feature in all of their products. Another reason why I believe Acura has been losing market share is their inexplicable tendency to hold on to their redesigns. Their worst case of this is the infamous ILX. The ILX was sold in the United States from 2013 to 2022. It was a rebadged 9th generation Honda Civic, but while in 2015 the Civic evolved into the 10th generation, the ILX bypassed this update and kept its original platform until its discontinuation in 2022. That was a very poor move from Acura who failed to keep the ILX minimally interesting as most Acuras are rebadged Honda products that offer more amenities. In this case, the 10th generation Honda Civic sold concurrently to the ILX, but the Civic was bigger, was more powerful, and it had better technology throughout. Another example of this is the current generation RDX. It shares the same platform as the Honda CRV, but while the CRV has moved on to its sixth generation since 2022, the Acura RDX carries on into 2024 on the same platform, leaving Acura diehard fans hoping for a full redesign that comes in 2025, which is three years late. And lastly, another aspect that has hurt Honda sales growth is competition, new and old. Lexus and Infinity came right after Acura as the two other luxury brands from Japan, but since then, brands like Audi have grown in market share as well. Infinity has shrunk to a point of irrelevance, but Lexus outsold Acura 2 to 1 in 2022. And since 2008, Genesis has been growing in sales in the United States. The Korean brand sold over 56,000 vehicles compared to 102,000 vehicles sold by Acura last year. Price-wise, Acura no longer presents the obvious advantage over other brands in the segment. While in the 80s, their models were a bargain compared to other premium brands, that is not necessarily the case anymore, with most of their products priced around the same or slightly under the competition. So Acura, a car company once known for innovation is now trading other companies in the premium segment. It's late to electrification as well. In 2024, we'll be finally offering its first EV in the resurrected name of the ZDX, nothing else than a rebatch GM product. What could go wrong? An alarming fact is that Acura yearly sales peaked back in 2005 at 209,000 vehicles thanks to the sales allocated to the popular then TL. And those are my reasons why I believe Acura has lost relevance in the premium segment. But let me know in the comments, were you a teenager in the 80s or perhaps the 90s and remember what Acura once was? Do you currently own an Acura? Are you a former Acura owner that has moved on to a different premium brand? I want to know your reasons. Please let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.